I think that you know we should never believe we're stuck. The greatest asset that we have in our mind is our inquisitive nature. And it's so important to ask better questions because only then can we get better answers. So if anybody's stuck, that one thing, am I asking myself the right question should really mm -hmm. become the answer. Hello, and welcome to Pursuing Health. I'm Dr. Julie Fouché, family physician and former CrossFit Games athlete. Here, I bring you information and inspiration to help bridge the gap between fitness and medicine and support your journey toward your healthiest self. In this episode, I'm excited to share a conversation with you that I had with Dr. David Hasse, who's a family physician. He's on the faculty of the Institute for Functional Medicine, of which I've taken many of his courses, and he's also become a friend and a mentor to me. A little bit of background about Dr. Hasse before we dive in. He received his medical training at Vanderbilt University and completed his residency in family medicine at the Mayo Clinic. He's board certified in family medicine, integrative holistic medicine, neurofeedback, and functional medicine. And he also holds additional training and certifications in nutrition, health coaching, systems biology, genomics, bioinformatics, and precision medicine. In his practice, he strives to be a super generalist, looking at the human body as a whole and applying relentless curiosity to identify and treat the root cause of his patient's symptoms. And in this episode, we talk about the importance of this curiosity, the potential of the human brain, and how better questions lead to better answers, specifically in regard to our own health journeys. Before we dive in, I do want to make it clear that this podcast is for general information only and does not provide medical advice. I recommend that you seek assistance from your personal physician for any health conditions or concerns. So with that, let's get started with the episode. Welcome to Pursuing Health. I am very excited to be here with Dr. David Hasse, who um, is someone I've gotten to know over the past, I think, year and a half now, maybe a little bit more. And I'm so glad to finally have you on the podcast. So welcome. Oh, thank you, Julie. It's a great delight to be here. Um, I thought one of the things that we connected on when we first met was just our roots in family medicine. And I know you did your training at Mayo Clinic and I did my training at the Cleveland Clinic, which are these sort of rival um, hospital systems. But could you start off by just telling listeners what first attracted you to a career as a physician and then why you decided to go into family medicine? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, I grew up in a little town in South Dakota and I had a, the traditional family doctor kind of taking care of me. So that was my model to begin with, but I went to Vanderbilt for medical school and they are a hyper specialized uh, place. Mm -hmm. So I was one of only like two people who decided to go into family medicine from there. And we have that in common too, because I think in my class of, of 32, I was the only one, maybe there was two in my year, but it was very rare um, yeah. at my medical school also. It was very subspecialized. And I'm, and I'm sure you, like myself, you know, had probably the opportunity to kind of pick any specialty and go anywhere we wanted to. We had, were fortunate to be in, and, and the, uh, but no, I did, because I actually saw three patients die in the mm -hmm. hospital uh, while I was a medical student. Uh, under the, and they were under the care of specialists that forgot about the person as a whole. Mm. And instead, we're, we're just treating the organs that they were responsible for and mm -hmm. basically miss something else. And it, it took me into this world of cognitive bias, you know, and uh, I, I was confronted at that time with this evidence that, you know, doctors and properly prescribed medications are the third, maybe fourth leading cause of death in the United States, you know, just that you know, medicine yeah. as its practice is dangerous. Mm -hmm. And um, so two things drove me into family medicine is that a, I wanted to become a generalist, you know, a super generalist, somebody who looked broadly at that person in the context of their life in the context of their community and, you know, understand who that person was so that we could better understand what challenges they were having. Um, and, uh, you know, that's how I kind of dove in. I went, but I had to go to Mayo Clinic to do family medicine, which feels like a, like a little odd, but it was <laughs> great. It was great. I got to be rub shoulders with all these amazing, super, super sub, sub, sub specialists. And mm -hmm. I became even more convinced of the need for a super generalist, you know, because people, uh, you know, are a whole lot more than their list of diagnosis codes and mm -hmm. they deserve to be you know, engaged as just full 
beings. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, so that's how I got into it, but. And I know that that quest didn't stop there. Yes. And I know that once you were in res, even, you know, as early as residency, you also started to identify some frustrations with Mm -hmm. just the way that medicine was practiced and you were part of an the first evidence-based medicine group in, I think in your residency or was in medical school, but you started to really get frustrated with um, how we were applying the evidence and and caring for patients. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah, man. Good memory, man. That was, that was a couple of years ago. We talked about that because yeah. <laughs> stuck with me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, because yeah, right then it, the term evidence-based medicine was just a new term and it was a really cool idea. It was like, Hey, you know what? Doctors should actually be able to read the medical literature and decipher studies on their own, not just <laughs> not just take it spoon fed from whatever drug rep came along, uh-huh. uh, telling them what it meant. Right? Yeah. And um, I've always been a very independent thinker, so I pulled together what was the first journal club in evidence based medicine at the Mayo Clinic, and my self and some internal medicine residents, and we'd pull together like three journal articles a month. And we just chew through them. We got a bioinformatics person to come teach us, you know, how to read statistics and, and, oh, it was the most disheartening thing ever (laughs) because we went six months, you know, 18 major articles that should be really practice changing that Mm -hmm. a lot of people were changing their practice based on. And it showed remarkable evidence for harm, remarkable evidence for ineffectiveness. Mm -hmm. So the literature was there. We were just listening to the spin rather mm-hmm. than the data. And, mm-hmm. and it really threw me into almost a therapeutic nihilism, right? Mm-hmm. I almost went, oh my gosh, what can we trust here? And, you know, mm-hmm. certainly not the drug reps, but um, we need to really think for ourselves. And um, that's it caused this big shift in me that I recognize that if, you know, you actually want, patients want to get better and doctors mm-hmm. Really, we go to medical school to help patients get better, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's the goal, (laughs) duh. But instead, you know, what we end up doing is learning how to uh, diagnose and treat, you know, basically name it, blame it, and tame it rather Mm -hmm. than understand it and unwind it. And um, that that hit me. So I Mm -hmm. got very passionate about, well, how do we, if all this information through evidence-based medicine is telling us that... um, our, our well-prescribed drugs and surgery are maybe uh, not as effective as we thought they were. What is effective? Mm-hmm. Uh, what actually creates health rather than what um, treats disease? And that's kind of become my quest. So ever since mm-hmm. leaving, ever since being in residency at Mayo, it's been, um, you know, many years of practice, you know, over 20 now, just trying to find underlying causes of illness and, continue to go after data sets that uh, help us understand the human condition and then apply the most direct and safe routes of healing to get someone to a higher state of function. Mm -hmm. And it's been, I mean, it's amazing to see and inspiring to see all the different places that you have looked and searched to find information that could help your patients and really understand and apply it. But I think it's interesting too, when we talk about uh, evidence-based medicine, how maybe when you first started that journal club, it was a lot of listening to what drug reps were saying. But I think even now when evidence-based medicine is something very common and it's taught in medical schools, there's still this danger of falling into the name it, blame it, tame it mentality where it's just because it takes so long for evidence to be incorporated into, into guidelines. And for so many um, systems, I think we're going down this route of having care paths or sort of algorithms where someone comes in with these symptoms, you do X, Y, and Z. And, and so we're still teaching people to follow the algorithm instead of really think about what's going on with the patient and apply it. And that's what sort of scares me a little bit about, you know, how, how um, algorithm and care path based a lot of medicine is now, especially when you think about like urgent care and primary care medicine. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So that's a, that's a challenge. And the other challenge is where are you getting your evidence from? Mm-hmm. Right? And, and so a big shift happened actually before I went to medical school um, that medical schools used to be largely publicly funded and that shifted in the early eighties. 
And, and so, and before that time, there's tons of great studies come out of medical schools about nutritional medicine, about herbal approaches, about lifestyle approaches, different exercise, man, you'd look at the literature of the seventies, you know, the seventies didn't give us much notable, but it actually gave us <laughs> like <laughs> on the seventies, but, um, <laughs> But the but it did give us a lot of really good basic science in this domain. But then medical schools had to start paying their own way. And where how do they do that? They couldn't start seeing more patients all of a sudden, although they did some did that. They there was a limited number of donors that they could get to fund it. But they had to start doing more research. And who could pay for the research other than the federal government? Well, private industry. Mm -hmm. So the the doctors started doing more drug based research, mm -hmm. and, and if a medical school faculty wanted to get tenure, they had to publish. So there became this kind of unholy relationship between the pharmaceutical industries, uh, the physicians who did research on drugs so they could publish papers, so mm -hmm. they could get tenure. And now what the evidence started to accumulate is just things that could be funded to study. Mm -hmm. And so the amount of papers that you can get on, you know, name your favorite statin are huge. Mm -hmm. There's massive money that went into these patented drugs. And so, oh, that's what we have evidence on. Well, you know, there's also this thing called common sense. <laughs> and, and there's also some evidence, you know, you, you don't need a double blind randomized placebo controlled trial to figure out are parachutes effective if you jump out of a plane, right? We mm -hmm. haven't run that trial. <laughs> <laughs> some things right? you don't need to test yeah <laughs> and, and you know you, so, some of the people who are you know so blind about uh uh you know that that's the only way we get knowledge i would suggest they enroll in that particular trial <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> who's going to be that sacrificial lamb <laughs> yeah i know but so you know the problem is it's not just that we uh, it takes a long time for basic science to get into medical practice it's not just the problem that, that um are in a kind of a medical industrial complex where pushes people through the system really fast, you know, mm -hmm. like an average visit of 10 minutes. And um, it's not just that. And it's not just that our medical re information repository is biased incredibly towards who could pay to have those studies made. It's all of those factors that have really created a, 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 a instead of a healthcare system, you know, a medical treatment maze and one that patients really feel kind of lost in. And, you know, people who are dedicated towards creating health in their own lives, they, they just feel a horrible mismatch between mm -hmm. what is, what they know works for their body and what they just makes common sense because humans are a biologic organism and biologic organisms have this capacity to heal. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we're not honoring that with all of our incredible science and capacity, uh, at, as a rule. So it's been the passion of how, how, how can we do that? Mm -hmm. And I know that, um, you have a lot of curiosity. Your book is called Curiosity Heals the Human. And because of that, it's led you down many different paths looking for answers to try to help your patients create health instead of just treating their disease. Can you just talk a little bit about some of those paths, You know what some of those paths are that you've gone down in order to try to learn more for your patients? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 the, uh, yeah, it's, you're right. My book is curiosity heals the human, <laughs> but the subtitle is how to solve the unsolvable with the better questions and advanced technology. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, you know, we should never believe we're stuck. Uh, the greatest asset that we have in our mind is our inquisitive nature. Mm -hmm. And, and it's so important to ask better questions because only then can we get better answers. So if anybody's stuck that, that one thing, am I asking myself the right question should really mm -hmm. become the, the answer. So if you're looking to create health, you know, it's not that difficult in the big picture, mm -hmm. you know, if you the, because a, uh, the body is a miraculous organism that has a self healing capacity. I think most everybody would agree with that, right? You mm -hmm. cut your arm, it knits itself back together, no matter how much you think about it or don't think about it. <laughs> it just does it pretty amazing. 
and we <laughs> eat food and, and we eat food and it miraculously becomes part of us. Yeah. It's like, and I say miraculously because the science is so incredibly, incredible. Advanced. I mean, I think the only way I can still describe it is as a miracle because yeah. it's so I still remember taking day, biology right? in uh, high school and learning about how cells work and just being blown. Like, that's when I think I knew I wanted to go into medicine. I was just blown away. Like, this is unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so the, um, the, so the body has a self-healing capacity. So our job, especially as physicians, um, is to work with our patients um, to figure that out. And since every patient is unique, everyone has unique genetics and they have bathed those genetics with a different lifestyle and a different environment over the course of many years, create a unique mm -hmm. person. And um, um, our job is to help create the most effective experiment of one for that person to run so that they can see, can I create health? Mm -hmm. And so we, I've been really interested in objective biomarkers uh, you know, how do we actually measure the state of health of an individual? And the area I'm most interested in objective biomarkers is the brain, because mm -hmm. if you want to pick an organ that you want to have functioning <laughs> well, that's the organ you really want functioning well. That's uh, for sure. Right. And so um, I've focused a lot of our efforts on how we, uh, how we both uh, recover our best brain and how mm -hmm. we develop our best brain. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, one of the things I kind of brought into the, f the realm of integrative and functional medicine was uh, quantitative EEG and neurofeedback. Mm -hmm. And this is a technology that's really quite remarkable for head injuries. And oh my gosh, the number of people that have head injuries and don't know it are wow. amazing. Yeah, exactly. Just so like a fall when you were a kid that you don't remember or things like that. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. that person that you know, that is just kind of a, well, an a-hole, right? <laughs> yeah. You got to scratch your head and say, well, is that a head injury? Mm, yeah. My mom, I, I can't remember. Was my mom said she dropped me on my head when I was a baby or not. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, well, yeah. you know, it, it, it is, it's always these questions about how much, um, I you think people are generally good, right? Mm -hmm. And we want good things for ourselves. We want good things for other people. And when you see that off, there's almost always trauma of some sort, physical trauma, an emotional trauma, a biologic trauma, metabolic imbalance. Uh, humans that are healthy are happy. And, mm -hmm. and, and I really believe that. And I've gotten to see so many people get their lives and their brains back that mm -hmm. I have to, you know, I've just gotten more evidence as I've gotten older on that. So, yeah, so we started measuring the brain quantitatively so we can say, hey, uh, here's the electricity of your brain. And I can compare that against an FDA's database of average normal brains mm -hmm. and, and saying, look here, this spot in your brain governs you know, impulse control. And mm -hmm. it is essentially offline. It's, it's malfunctioning. And you know what's amazing? I love sitting knee to knee with a patient and showing them their brain map. Mm -hmm. this three-dimensional construct of their electrical efficiency of their brain and, and getting to show them that, yeah, there is a, there's, there's an anatomic and physiologic reasons why they behave or experiencing life as they are. The amount of shame and guilt that people can let go of when they finally recognize, yeah, mm -hmm. my organ isn't working as it should. Mm -hmm. It's not my soul that's broken. Mm -hmm. You know, their soul is fine. Right. They actually need to recognize how beautiful and majestic and perfect their soul is. Mm -hmm. And, but, but their brain has a real issue. And now let's dig into that, you know, mm -hmm. because we never blame our knee, right? If our knee be hurt, you know, we, we, we don't, you know, have shame and guilt about it. Right. But, uh, right? <laughs> but if our mood is bad or attention's off or, you know, our, it, anyway, we we just blame and give shame to so many things in our brain that we shouldn't. And as soon as okay. we let go of that, we have a remarkable capacity to heal, but it requires asking a different question. Mm -hmm. It required, you have to ask the question, how could my brain be not accessing the potential it has the capacity to experience mm -hmm. and, and then being curious and digging into that. Mm -hmm. And to talk about, you know, just talking about brain disorders as well, you know, what a great example of a lot of diagnoses that 
are very complex and multifactorial, but we in our conventional system try to give one treatment that often doesn't work very well, whether it's a medication for anxiety or whether it's Alzheimer's or dementia that we don't have really much for in our conventional system. And so, you know, starting to to apply this your approach where you're looking at all the factors and not just one when you is when you start to make a lot of progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's some, there's some real fundamentals, right? So how, what's a good experiment? A good experiment is where you're bringing, you know, so you want to, there's basically four things you do. It's like, how do I replenish the things my miraculous body needs in -hmm. order to heal? Right. Let's, let's replenish it. Let's get at the air, the water, the nutrients, the light, the relationships, all that, that it needs in order to thrive. Mm -hmm. Second is uh, remove what is inhibiting my body's miraculous capacity for self-healing? Is there a toxin, an, an allergen, an infection, a trauma? Uh, you know, what is there that should be actively removed? And, and that can be super easy and it can be really tough. It can happen quickly. It can take years and years. So mm-hmm. it all depends on how deep-seated one of these challenges are. The third thing is, um, what can we retrain um, allergies are mm. basically your body um, having an immune response against something that should be considered benign. Well, mm-hmm. we do sublingual immunotherapy in our clinic to kind of retrain the body so it uh, recognizes benign substances as benign again. And that's useful. We use neurofeedback to retrain brain patterns so that it is more effective. You use things like physical therapy and athletic training to retrain balance to, mm-hmm. you know, you, you, after an injury, or maybe you've never developed those tools, but it's that mindful um, type of uh, recognizing that there's a dysfunctional pattern. And then fourthly is we, we call it reset. <laughs> reset mm-hmm. is all right. We're going to do a lot of things at once, or we're going to do some therapies that really um, shake the body up because we know the body can find its way back to a higher state of organization. Mm-hmm. And so you may actually have to add a little chaos. Uh, so this is a little bit what we think about our therapeutic plasma exchange for treating dementia. Uh, it's like a big reset button that mm-hmm. we can hit um, and, or like doing all these things at once and, you know, doing a program so that you're, um, shaking up your body's, uh, set point. Set point's a really important concept. You know, you are, are inertia is a really powerful, um, you know, law of the universe. You know, objects mm-hmm. at rest, stay at rest. Objects in motion, stay in motion. And and it's hard to make those momentum changes. So when you need, when you're really, really stuck, you're most likely going to need some pretty massive action to get unstuck. uh, And then uh, some new behaviors to make sure that you're going to continue down that path. So yeah, Mm -hmm. so replenish, remove, reset, uh, and retrain is the way we kind of think about everything, whether it's the neurologic system, the immune system, the mitochondria, the hormones, uh, uh, our social life, our personal life, our spiritual life. All of those things are fair game uh, to enable the body's capacity to heal. I love it. And they all work together. I love that, that concept of just shaking things up a little bit and allowing it to reset. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to dig in a little bit more to neurofeedback. So you started talking about the brain mass, but then can you explain what neurofeedback is and how that would work for a patient? Yeah, absolutely. So neurofeedback is kind of physical therapy for the brain. You know, most of, you know, physical therapy is you know, number one, strengthening your muscles, but a lot of physical therapy is actually retraining your brain mm-hmm. to control your body to have feedback and and understand like you're regaining your balance is your brain understanding where your body is in space. Mm -hmm. You know, it has something to do with the strength of your muscles and tissues, but almost entirely physical therapy is actually brain therapy. (laughs) And, um, and you know, with athletic training, right. How much of that is actually brain training. Uh, Oh yeah. Right. The vast majority of it. Right. Call it muscle memory or, reason why visualization works so well. Yeah. You know, I, I give a, I, I, I've taught uh, thousands of physicians about fatigue and I, I 
uh, run uh, a course on evaluation and treatment of fatigue. And one of my favorite slides in there is from uh, um, Parvo Nurmi, who is a, um, uh, they used to call him the flying fin. And he mm-hmm. was a, a, a uh, uh, an Olympian around the turn of the century. And, um, and he won incredible numbers of gold medals. You know, he was, uh, he was that standout of his era. And he had this great quote. He said, you know, mind is everything. Muscle is, are just pieces of rubber. <laughs> everything I am, I am because of my mind. So and it was true, like, right? Boom, right? Boom, boom. It's and that so mind, true. Yeah, exactly. So uh, back to the question of what is neurofeedback? So um, if somebody has a brain challenge and we think that that may be electrically caused, and so we figure that out by actually measuring the electricity of the brain. That would be like putting a cap on somebody's head and measuring the EEG. That's called the electroencephalogram or your brain waves. Mm-hmm. And we take those brain waves and we run them. Uh, and that would be done for like if you had a seizure disorder in the hospital. Or mm-hmm. So we're using that very same technology to understand um, the functioning of the brain. So you take those brain waves and you put them through um, a computerized evaluation tool. And then we compare the average brain waves of an individual to the average normal that would exist in many of our databases. And we have mm-hmm. databases of individuals that have high functioning, that are average functioning, and that are super peak performers. Mm-hmm. I have a database of the 2014 class of Marine Special Forces recruits. Wow. Uh, that's a fascinating group, right? Yeah. But, but you also wouldn't want to compare a great artist brain to that brain. Mm-hmm. You know, peak performance is, has some variability to it. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. anyway, the first thing you do with neurofeedback is you make a good diagnosis by doing a good evaluation then you're going like, yeah, this person has terrible attention problems and impulsivity problems. And yes, we can see here in the medial prefrontal cortex, they have uh, a tremendous increase excess of theta waves, which would be like a a trance-like wave. So Mm -hmm. they're sitting in life and the part of their brain that should be paying attention is going into a trance-like state when they need to be paying attention to the world. Mm -hmm. And um, so what we can do is this process of neurofeedback, we can actually train the brain to have more normal brain waves. And it's done very simply. Our patients come in, they sit in front of a computer screen, and oftentimes we'll just play a movie for them. And we'll put the cap on their head and we'll have the computer start watching their brain waves. Mm -hmm. And we're measuring 19 channels, 16,000 measurements every four seconds, and then um, a, thousands and thousands of calculations based upon those members, those uh, relationships. And we have set a condition for success. So as we watch the brain's electricity, if that brain's electricity moves towards what we know is higher function, the movie plays bright and loud and the patient likes it. It's like, Oh Mm -hmm. good, there's the movie. And if, as we're watching the brain waves, that those brain waves move away from what we want to reinforce, the movie gets dark and quiet. Mm -hmm. And since the brain wants to watch the movie, it figures out which nerves, which neurons to fire to make the movie play. And that happens to be a state of higher functioning. And because neurons that fire together wire together, Mm -hmm. um, we get long lasting benefit from this. So essentially the brain is figuring out this three-dimensional electrical combination lock to turn to make the movie play. And as the brain turns that lock, those neurons are firing together, they're wiring together, And the brain develops new efficiency. And the upshot of that is they start to have better attention and better impulse control in their life. Mm -hmm. It's really amazing. I have patients that have had head injuries 20 years before coming to our clinic. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Wayne was a guy who came in uh, brought by his wife 
Uh, he had the mentation of essentially an 11 year old. He was subject to a massive head on car accident, mm-hmm. you know, t- some 20 years ago, he used to be a beloved high school coach. And now he was just a jerk mm-hmm. and he was a jerk of a 10 year old and he couldn't manage finances. Uh, his daughter that they had had at that time basically couldn't stand him, had a terrible relationship with this 10 year old as she was mm-hmm. growing up, kind of had to, um, deal with, uh, it was really terrible for his daughter. Um, and he came in and we started doing neurofeedback with him. And within 20 sessions, a uh, remarkable thing happened. The most remarkable thing he noticed is that his golf score improved 10 strokes. Oh, well, um, that's great. That was the one thing he would still do. He still was taken out by his old buddies to go golf. Okay. But, but more than that, he became emotionally regulated. He would actually mm. listen to his wife. He would take correction. He Mm. started to share his emotions and not act out in a juvenile way. After 40 and 60 sessions, he actually got to the point of asking her back out on dates. They went to the theater. They started having couples friends again. And um, after his 60th session, his wife came in just bawling. He said, because we went to visit our daughter And number one, he sat on the porch for an hour and a half talking to his son-in-law, who he has never had a conversation with in the five years that his daughter had been married, learned all about him, and then proceeded to go out into the yard and teach his granddaughter T-ball. Wow. And, you know, so he was back. He Uh got his brain back after 20 years. Wow. And, And it... I'm really thankful that was one of my earlier patients because I got to have a real level of clarity about how much potential the brain has and, Mm -hmm. and it never does ourselves or the world any favors if we hold back on our hope for regained function or improved function or peak potential. We never do the world any favors by being less than who we are. And giving our full gifts and trying our best to become the best version of ourselves. Yeah, it's, it's uh, remarkable stuff. Wow, that's incredible. And such an incredible example of, like you said, not giving up on hope and always having curiosity and keep asking the questions, right? No matter yeah. if it's been 20 years, um, still keep searching because you might find the thing that really makes an impact. Oh, I'm so glad you said that because that goes back to bias. Remember, that's mm-hmm. kind of what drove me into general, being mm-hmm. a super generalist, is bias, right? We only can see what we can see. Mm-hmm. And so if we have a brain problem, say a, a mood issue, we, you know, and, and we come from a world that's steeped in conventional medicine. We may think that, oh, that's a, that's a realm of the psychologist because I need to have a better story or mm-hmm. that's a, that's a problem. I'm just, I need to have a diagnosis and I have a drug deficiency. Uh, or, you know, maybe we think, oh, that's a sociologic problem. And, um, it's my family of origin. Um, but if we don't think about electricity possibly being a solution, or if we don't think about our biochemistry because inflammation makes a big difference or mm-hmm. hormone imbalance or oxidative stress or of our, our lifestyle, our circadian rhythm, maybe an old head injury, maybe a buildup of a cerebral spinal fluid, maybe a spinal misalignment, maybe a spiritual issue, maybe a, you know, well, think of all of these factors. So that many factors. It's not the water we swim in. Our mm-hmm. own bias causes us to be caged inside our own brain. Mm-hmm. And this is why asking different questions gives us the potential for greater healing. Mm-hmm. And if we're not getting the results that we desire, it's time to find somebody else that can ask different questions. Mm-hmm. It's time to start going outside of your box because doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is the definition of insanity. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're mm-hmm. just, just uh, go for it. That's amazing. Now, uh, the other therapy that you mentioned just briefly that is extremely cutting edge that I know you've spent a lot of time and effort researching and implementing is plasmapheresis. Um, and I think there was a study, a study that was first done in mice that sort of sparked your interest in the potential for this therapy. Can you talk about that? 
Yeah, sure. So remember how I said that there's four ways to heal somebody. Mm -hmm. We, you know, this, um, what we call regenerative plasma exchange has the potential to hit all four of those mm -hmm. of re replenishing, of removing, of retraining and resetting. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of the reasons that pulled me to it. So, oh gosh, it's a long story. I did a TED <laughs> talk about this. So yes, know, it was amazing. I can forward people to my check TED it talk out. So yes, we'll link to that. Kind of, and mm -hmm. this was, you know, almost three years ago. I did that TED talk now. And uh, we had been developing this new way of treating Alzheimer's disease. And because um, what was found is that in mice, if you took the um, plasma, the liquid part of the blood of a young mouse, and you put it inside an old mouse, that old mouse started to turn young. Or <laughs> if you pulled the old plasma out of that young mouse, or excuse me, if you pulled the old plasma out of the old mouse mm -hmm. and just replaced it with kind of clean replacement fluid, that old mouse would start to de-age. It would mm -hmm. start to become young again as well. Mm -hmm. um, the lesson is that old is toxic and that we actually have messages of old that flow through our blood that impair our stem cells ability to heal our body from the inside out really remarkable study published in aging. Uh, that's the journal aging uh, in July bore this out and they were showing multi-tissue regeneration, reversal of fatty liver disease, reversal of osteoporosis, re new neurogenesis starting with just removing the old plasma from an old mouse. And then there was a big study done utilizing a therapy like I'm doing uh, in doing this plasma exchange to treat Alzheimer's disease. Now, just for everybody, it's plasma exchange. Most people go, what is that? Well, <laughs> plasma exchange is a standard medical treatment mm -hmm. that is used to treat very severe autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. So people with, we treat people with multiple sclerosis, neuromyelitis optica, myasthenia gravis, they're horrible neurologic diseases usually. Mm -hmm. And we put an IV in one arm. Uh, we pull the blood out, um, you know, a lot of blood. We mix it with an anticoagulant and then we separate the cells from the liquid part of the blood. Um, the we keep the cells and those get mixed with a clean plasma replacement fluid and all that goes back in the body. And we run that machine until we've removed three or four liters of the liquid part of that person's plasma. Mm -hmm. The old plasma that we've removed, we throw away. Mm -hmm. Well, um, they did that particular procedure, that plasma exchange on people with mild and moderate Alzheimer's disease. And in individuals with moderate Alzheimer's disease, and let's just say there's nothing moderate about moderate Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. This means that people are already institutionalized. They often don't remember family. They're getting close to losing bodily function. They certainly lost all forms of independence. But even in those individuals that advanced, over 14 months of getting this therapy, uh, 18 separate sessions over 14 months, they had a 60% decrease in their rate of progression. 60% decrease in their rate of progression. That's after nearly 20 years without a new pharmaceutical treatment for Alzheimer's disease with no new advances. Mm -hmm. But in this is the exciting part. In mild Alzheimer's disease, those individuals over 14 months actually had improvement. Their brains were better off 14 months later than when they started. That's wow. unheard of. Never happens. And never <laughs> happens. Never happens. And you know, there's a bunch of things that we, we treat Alzheimer's disease from a systems medicine model. Mm -hmm. So we also apply a lot of the, what else do we need to restore, yep. remove, retrain mm -hmm. uh, in this process? But it's a remarkable. So we're now offering this plasma exchange for the um, longevity community. There are people mm -hmm. who are dedicated towards extending their healthy lifespan. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we believe, and we've been able to show that there is measurable markers of age regeneration. Now we do a bunch of other things on top of what was done in the study. Mm -hmm. But um, so I think this is great for the biohacking community, for the longevity community. Um, we're trying to treat people as early as possible in the neurodegenerative cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and it's fun to watch people's brains get better. We just had Amazing. one of our patients that has a, 
a type of dementia that has impaired emotional regulation. Um, and he's been going through, he's had now four sessions of plasma exchange and his wife and him have had regular civil conversations and he's replying to his emails with appropriate responses. And he is, um, you know, not irritated by their animals anymore. He's actually mm -hmm. getting better. And wow. this is, anyway, it's fun because when neurodegeneration is pretty hard to see placebo responses, when people don't have great memory about mm -hmm. their actual condition, mm -hmm. um, the responses are um, pretty believable. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it is the most exciting work I've been done, but it is really hard, hard to do. We have people fly to our, our center here in Nashville from uh, all across the United States and, um, we're working very hard to make this uh, technology available to more people. But uh, yeah, the body is designed to heal if, mm -hmm. we, if we give it what it needs and remove the barriers. That's incredible. And I love to, you know, these are very um, sort of cutting edge treatments that are not as widely available. Just talking about plasmapheresis and neurofeedback. I mean, I know neurofeedback is now more widely available, but you talk a lot about addressing the soup and the spark of the brain, like the biochemistry and the electrical part of the brain. And you can obviously, you know, use these extremely cutting edge therapies, but there's also a lot of things that people can do to address those that are very easily accessible. So what, what things could you recommend for the soup and the spark that are, <laughs> that are maybe first steps that people could try? Well, absolutely. So, you know, what we call uh, soup is, I always say, okay, imagine that brain and, and just metaphorically cut it open and see what oozes out. That's your soup. Mm -hmm. And, and those are all your neurotransmitters and your immune molecules and your structural, you know, your energy making capacity. Um, you know, that's your biochemistry. And then spark is all of the electrical activity, your brain waves, because your brain is really an electrical organ, you know, that's only about 2% of your body weight, but it consumes about 23% of your daily energy. That always blows my mind. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, you have a furnace inside that skull. Of yours, right? <laughs> I mean, it There's is. a lot going on in there. Hopefully. It's hot. You know, brain cell uh, consumes five times more energy than its corresponding heart cell in a day. Wow. You, wow. you think that a heart cell is constantly doing, doing this physical activity of pumping, muscle pumping, muscle pumping, but making electricity, whoo, now that's a job. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, but what do you do to improve your soup and spark? Well, you know, it's something I'm sure that nobody in your, uh, in, in, on your podcast does, uh, but uh, exercise is a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they know a thing or two about that. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's the miracle drug, right? Mm -hmm. It really is. I mean, I, mm -hmm. you can go through uh, any number of the, so many, 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 many different mechanisms of how exercise helps, but it's very important to recover. One mm -hmm. of the big problems with people that get that see exercise as the answer to everything is that they overdo it mm -hmm. and they don't allow themselves the necessary component of recovery as they are doing their exercise. So, mm -hmm. you know, we've, we've actually treated many um, endurance athletes that have um, a terrible problem with excess oxidative stress. And, um, and there's many nutritional supplements and things like that that can help. But mm -hmm. most important is to uh, listen to your body. So Absolutely. exercise is super important. And then the other thing about um, soup is making sure you're adequately hydrated. I mean, it's such a super simple thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's astounding um, how much impairment that our cells can have, metabolically speaking, by being slightly dehydrated. Mm -hmm. Other things are in decreasing the inflammogens in your food. You know, it's very rare that I find anybody that's healthier as a result of eating gluten. Mm -hmm. just <laughs> haven't really seen that. Yeah. And that's a real tragedy to me. I think it's a, a testimony to just how polluted our food sources have become and uh, that the, the wheat of today is absolutely not the wheat uh, that humans, humans uh, evolved to you know, mm -hmm. be able to tolerate and eat well. Mm -hmm. So, um, and especially for the brain too. Oh, um, yeah. I think that, yeah, 
inflammation is terrible, Ter- mm-hmm. you know, terribly decreases brain function. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing, and we think about like you hear about it a lot for, especially for GI symptoms. And so I think often people will say, well, I don't really have any GI symptoms. So I think gluten's okay. Um, but I mean, we know that gluten can get into the brain and can affect brain function yeah. as well. It, it, um, you know, uh, fatigue is an emotion. Fatigue mm-hmm. is actually a complex emotion. And that's why it can be so highly varied uh, mm-hmm. from person to person and experience to experience. And um, you should pay very close attention to your emotions. They are there for you. Mm-hmm. They are your early warning signs that uh, are telling you that you should be doing something differently in your life. The emotion is the energy of motion. And if you're having fatigue, think of it as an emotion. It is fatigue is telling you something is really not working as it should. Mm-hmm. And um, inflammation and stress are the two things that need to be dug into aggressively uh, to get to a non-fatigued state. Mm-hmm. Okay. So sorry, I sidetracked us a little bit, but those are some things you could do to address the soup. Um, how about the spark? Well, the, the spark, um, you know, that's kind of a challenging thing because there's not many ways you can treat the spark without neurofeedback directly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can absolutely do things like meditation. So mm-hmm. meditation over the course of time, you are going to change the, your general brainwave patterns. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we know that, uh, people who have spent thousands of hours in meditation will have a different type of brainwave pattern mm-hmm. have association with activation, the parts of the brain that, are, that correlate with happiness. Mm-hmm. Um, it's powerful. And um, so I'm a big fan of meditation, prayer. Um, those things do change your brain. But in my experience that they don't necessarily change it electrically um, unless you're putting in uh, hundreds and hundreds right. and, and possibly thousands of hours. Mm-hmm. Um, EMDR is a therapy that helps people with trauma break mm-hmm. through their trauma. Uh, so their thoughts are no longer as um, affected, but it doesn't seem to affect their electricity of their brain very mm-hmm. much. Okay. And um, so we actually recommend people do EMDR and trauma therapy along with neurofeedback hmm, because okay. it seems that they become much more resistant to relapse when you've dealt with both the spark and the story. Got you know, it. I, I love my S's, right? So yes, <laughs> so you can That's read about that. you can read about the, all the multiple S's in in uh, in my book if you like. <laughs> That's great. And even thinking too, just about, um, you know, our environment, like you said, changing our thoughts or changing our environment, that maybe the people we surround ourselves trying to have more positive thoughts or even thinking about like cognitive behavior therapy. I'm not sure if any of those things have been shown to actually change brain function or structure, but. um, So so again, if if you, if your life is awesome, if you're happy, productive mm -hmm. and functioning well, it doesn't really matter what your brain map looks like. Okay? <laughs> That's right. Let's, let's be careful not to worship uh, a, a laboratory study of any mm-hmm. sort. Uh, what is the gold standard are results. Mm-hmm. How are you really functioning in the world? Mm-hmm. The, the challenge with that is that, you know, denial ain't just a river in Egypt. And uh, <laughs> we, we get very used to our dysfunctions. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that's pretty universal as, as far as humans go. You know, we get very used to whatever is as being what should be. Mm-hmm. And it's really the job of physicians and family and friends to call people out saying, you know what? I, I, I desire for you to take better care of yourself, to relook at some of these things because yeah. you have more potential to contribute in this world. You have more potential to be a fuller version of yourself. You have more mm-hmm. potential to experience greater joy and, um, and meaning in this world. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it often takes a friend to call us out and say, yeah. you know what, you know, you ain't so hot. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have it all figured out. You're not that healthy. <laughs> yeah. And to shake things up, like you said before, some, just to have the courage to do that for people in your life that knowing they might not be happy about it in the moment, but if you can help them shake things up enough to realize some of the 
dysfunctions that they're living in that they've just become accustomed to, then maybe that's the best gift you could give them. Uh, absolutely. You know, um, yeah, tough love happens in the gym a lot, right? <laughs> Yeah. Right. Come on, you can, you can do it. You know, little, 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 a little prodding, a little poking. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Right. You know. So. Right. Just because you want to make make the people around you better. Yeah. Exactly. Um, wonderful. Well, there's three questions that I ask everyone at the end of the podcast. So we'll wrap up with these. The first one is, what is the or what are the three things that you do on a regular basis that have the biggest positive impact on your health? Mm, that's a great question. Well, um, number one, I have a, a morning prayer routine that mm -hmm. is incredibly important for my centering. Uh, and uh, yeah, so prayer. Uh, secondly would be um, I, I re-examine uh, written goals and written mm -hmm. visions on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have some absolutely amazing nutritional supplements that uh, I used to have a problem remembering to take until <laughs> I recognize that um, that's an act of self-love for me mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, and that I'm worth actually loving myself. Yeah. And, and, and instead of thinking that, oh, these, these pills are somehow uh, a sign that I am not sufficient or broken somehow. No, these are acts of self-love for me and my mm -hmm. own self-care. So yeah, that's, that's amazing. Um, any particular stuff? I mean, I guess it's a tough question given what you do and it's so individual, but any particular supplements that you think have the biggest impact for you? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, I've been the, uh, the medical director of the largest professional supplement company in the United States. So I have, I have, <laughs> I have for, I've you. formulated hundreds of, of nutritional yeah. supplements and know the dark side of the industry and all that other fun stuff. Uh, but um, I'll tell you the one I'm most interested in right now. Um, and I think it's near the top of my list is something called endocalyx pro. And mm. uh, this is actually something to treat the glycocalyx. The glycocalyx is a gel-like Teflon coating in the inside of blood vessels. And, and that glycocalyx um, enables our red blood cells to zip through without friction to uh, turn on nitric oxide. So without the glycocalyx, mm -hmm. without this goo that's in the inside of your capillaries, mm -hmm. um, you can't turn on your nitric oxide production. Without that goo, you start to have coagulation. Without that goo, you um, have a collapse of capillaries and a loss of tissue perfusion. So if your capillaries aren't working, your organs actually start to starve. So you get organ starvation. This is where frailty comes from largely. When you have mm -hmm. diffuse vascular dysfunction, people mm -hmm. just start to shrink. I mean, that's, you, we see it all the time in aged mm -hmm. individuals. And I think that's a primarily a vascular problem that's mm -hmm. going on there. So uh, Endocalyx Pro has actually had shown the capacity to help rebuild that layer. And, um, and we're, we're, the reason I'm excited about it is that we've been tracking the microcirculatory function as we have doing therapeutic plasma exchange for dementia. Mm -hmm. And okay. we recognize this as a major mechanism of action of yeah. where we're fixing the microvasculature. And, and of interest, COVID, its major area yeah. of injury is this microvascular system. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and that, that's not even a supplement that, uh, that Zymogen, the company I, I run, uh, makes it all. So that's not, mm -hmm. that's not a plug for any kind of <laughs> I, I, I sell or, or advocate for. I think it's just yeah. brilliantly done and there's really good science behind it. Yeah. Wow. That's fascinating. Um, okay. Next question is what is one thing that you think would have a big impact on your health, but you have a hard time implementing it. So maybe before it was taking your supplements, um, or something you're working on right now. Yeah. I always have a challenge with night eating, mm, you know, yes. eating at night. Mm -hmm. And, and again, it goes back to self care. Do mm -hmm. I really care for myself and, and have I overloaded my day? You mm -hmm. know, have I, you know, decided to, you know, cram uh, 36 hours of work into a 24 hour day. Right. Yes. <laughs> and, um, so yeah. So that's something I still struggle with. Yes. I think a lot of us can relate. All right. Last question is what does a healthy life look like to you? Oh, so I actually define health as Maxwell. 
Mm-hmm. And Maxwell, uh, it happens to be the name of our clinic. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Maxwell for me stands for the that optimal state of body, mind, spirit that um, best enables me to pursue my dreams, to um, achieve my goals, and to enjoy the process. And that's really what it's about. It's about both be maxing, which is striving and pushing and developing and growing. And it's also about welling, which would be, you know, that soulful surrender of the now, uh, the, the, the satisfaction of whatever is. And, and paradoxically holding both that max and that well together, holding, mm-hmm. you know, striving and uh, satisfaction uh, simultaneously. And uh, yeah, that's what health looks like for me. That is beautiful. I love it. Um, Well, thank you. This has been wonderful. Um, Where can people learn more about you, your clinic, about things that you're up to? Yeah, absolutely. Well, maxwellclinic.com is always the best place to come learn about our clinic. And then uh, davidhazimd.com is another Mm place. Um, I'm on, you can look David MD on Facebook, Twitter, uh, and, um, I post things occasionally there mm-hmm. uh, and you're on Instagram yeah. too, but you, I yeah. don't think you use that as much, but no, you've got I, some I, good I, stuff on I there. Haven't, haven't, haven't gotten into the grams yet, so. <laughs> I, I, um, but you know, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it, I've got some people helping me now. So I, I think we'll see more, more effect there, but, um, thank you very much for having me on. I love educating. Uh, mm-hmm. I love enabling people to be the fullest versions of themselves. And every single listener has the capacity to enjoy their life more and to give more contribution to the world. Um, and that's what we're here for. We're here for each other. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing when that comes to pass. That is right. That is right. And thank you so much for everything that you do. I think, you know, even from the first time that we met a year and a half ago or however long ago it was, um, I have just been so inspired by your care for people. And like you say, really wanting to help, to understand the person and help the person, not just the patient and their diagnosis and to really embrace and dig into all the complexity that human beings are and to not you know, not be afraid to figure it out. You're just excited to try to keep turning over stones and look under every single possible um, area to find a solution that could help someone. And so I think, you know, if everyone, all of the doctors in the U S and the world had that same mentality and we had a system that supported it, I think that we would all be um, in a lot better hands. So thank you for everything you do and for inspiring me and for inspiring so many. Well, and and back at you. Thank you very much for this time. And uh, thanks for being the change that we want to see in the world. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you enjoy listening to the podcast, please consider subscribing and giving it a five-star rating on iTunes. It really does help to get the word out to more people. 